Dear speakers and panelists of today's event, dear members and friends of the European Audiovisual uh, Observatory, liebe Frau Nikolchev, let me start with congratulating you and your team on your prophetic abilities in choosing the date for this event. <laughs> this Sunday has been a day for the history books, almost two and a half years after this fateful date in 2016, the European Union and the British government signed a deal to establish the terms of the Brexit and gave indications on the future relationship. And now, all quiet on Brexit front? Not likely. As anyone who followed the Brexit coverage recently knows, Getting this deal approved by the British Parliament will be an enormous act of statecraft, to paraphrase President Juncker. This means, while hoping the best, we still have to prepare the worst. Still, Bavaria hopes for a close relationship with the United Kingdom in trade, as in other vital areas like, for example, security. Ladies and gentlemen, Services and media content play an important role for Bavaria too in and beyond Brexit. Media, con media content is a decisive part in our digital world. Therefore, it's of crucial importance how and from whom all the visual content is produced and provided. However, borders between the players in the media sector are not longer real boundaries. Internet-driven providers produce programs and films without the middlemen of traditional media thus becoming new competitors. But not only content questions are significant mm -hmm. for us because the whole media sector is for itself is very important for Bavaria. Munich is Germany's number one media location with a total turnover of 12.7 billion euro. In addition, Bavaria is a topic location in film technology. Ali Media, Germany's largest post-production facility, has its main seat in Munich. As a camera maker, this, com this company has already won has already won 19 technical Oscars, the latest in 2017. Besides that, Bavaria is an important studio and production location. Film crews are a common sight. On the website of Bavaria Tourism, you can, for example, find a filming location database if you are looking for a famous location in a city or in, on a full landscape. And, for example, the Munich Bavaria Film Group is one of the largest studio operators in Europe. The Free State of Bavaria is also plays a decisive role on the EU level use the cultural sovereignty and responsibility for the audiovisual field in Germany. Cultural issues belong to the competence of the German lender and not to the federal government. Therefore, Bavaria has been assigned by Chancellor Angela Merkel to negotiate for all Germany, so for all German lenders, the amendment of the AVMD. The United Kingdom, on the other hand, is the main European hub for TV and on-demand on -demand providers, but in some four months, the Brexit takes effect, with still uncertain outcome. Therefore, the topic of today's event, the, the effects, challenges and opportunities of Brexit for the audiovisual sector is extremely important. <laughs> Against this background, let me now switch to Susanne Nkolchev, Executive Director of the European Audiovisual Observatory, in order to get closer to the eagerly awaited panel discuss discussion. Liebe Frau Nikolce, the floor is yours. We will buy also gerne this one. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Herzlichen Dank, Frau Schretter. Many thanks for this 
nice words. Also, thanks for hosting once more this observatory event. It's the fourth time we are here, the fifth time we have this Brussels conference. And um, it is really also amazing to see how many of you have come today, despite, I think, the many discussions that also this particular topic already has triggered. Now, I tend to believe that the fact that you're here is because you liked what we published and you really are keen to getting more explanation to our um, publications, which you can get for free outside. I hope you already took your copy. But um, before I go really on to this topic, I wanted to give you some housekeeping points. There is Wifey in the room, and for those who want to tweet, you might, which you are very welcome to do, you might need to know the password, which is Bavaria dot, no, excuse me, it's Bavaria is the Wifey, and the password is exclamation mark, Europe, one, two, three. Also another housekeeping point, you see my colleague Alison there with a film camera. If you do not wish to appear on our video that we will then make available to the public, also to cater to people who couldn't make it here today, then maybe you want to stay away in the back rows. It doesn't mean that you cannot participate also in the discussions, you would just have to announce that we have to cut you out later when we do the editing of the film. Third housekeeping point which is also very important um, and I think is required already for due respect to our host. Once the conference is over, we will have to ask you to clear the room very quickly because there are other people who also want to use this marvelous room. So this uh, so much for the formal part. And then before we dive into a bit more the topic, uh, a few words about the observatory. You have seen the publication. We are still a small team, 25 people based in Strasbourg as part of the Council of Europe, supported mainly by our four, 42 members. 40 members are also member states of the Council of Europe, but in addition we have Morocco as a member and we have a very much treasured member in the European Union. So this just as a little bit of background, you know we are there to really provide information, also analysis. We are not there to get into any policies and you will see that this is also a red thread of this um, conference for us, it is about informing the debate, having the debate in this case also more than usually with you, because I think it's very important that we get a lot of input from people who know the practical business, and uh, we will try to make sure that there is time for that exchange. Now, with this being said, of course, yes, it's uh, very timely, this <laughs> conference, and uh, it's all triggered by one very simple event, a withdrawal letter that was sent on 29th of March 2017 and using or in application of an article that I think most people thought would maybe never be used, this famous article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union. This led then to, as things stand, the situation that on um, Friday, 29th of March at midnight, the Brexit will actually take effect. And now, what does the Brexit really do? Well, that we are leaving now already a little bit the, the certainty, because we do not know yet what the deal really is. Now we have a first uh, agreement. It still needs to be ratified within the EU. It needs also to pass, of course, um, the house in the United Kingdom and all of this we will see what happens. In any event, it is, when you see this agreement, it's not very specific on the audiovisual sector. So we still, even if all of this were now to happen as people have scheduled, it doesn't mean that we know that much. What we do know is that whatever deal we get in the end, it's going to be a really big deal. And you know why? because of some facts that we can just state on the UK industry. You'll hear more later from my colleague Jill, but just to give you the first flavor, the UK represents 21% 20, 
of the EU audiovisual market. So with Germany together, it is the biggest market in the EU. It produces 16% of the EU films and is even the number one producer when it comes to high-end TV series in Europe. And also, and I think by now often quoted, it's the main country of establishment, so it's the main hub for broadcasters, for TV channels, and also for on-demand services in the EU 28, as it stands today. So what? Well, this didn't just happen, that all happened within a European legal framework. And the legal framework, just to show the most important rules and I will not get into any detail here, obviously. <coughs> the bulk part is the European Union side. And you are, I assume, most of you quite familiar with these legal instruments. The Council of Europe has a little role to play too. What used to be its major uh, instrument, the European Convention on Transfrontier Television, wasn't so much in the news anymore. It is much more now, because maybe it comes to life again, who knows. And then just to mention it, also important, of course, are bilateral co-production mm -hmm. agreements in general for the European Union in the production for film and um, also in the UK. Now, what happens then on the day after Brexit? This happens. It doesn't happen maybe so radically, because uh, the national laws are still in, in place as they, uh, as they transpose the EU legislation, but eventually we will have to face this situation. <clears throat> and again, so what? Does this need to be all bad? Maybe it's not just a challenge, but also a chance. And I think here we're now coming to what I hope we can do today to look a little bit together, not just Brexit, what is good, what is bad, what do we hope, but we have a situation, what can we do with it? Mm -hmm. Let's think together what can we do in order to keep a European common market which is very much intertwined and cooperating. So what can be forward-looking approaches with the means that we will have left? What can the professionals do in particular to help each other to continue working with each other. What I would really urge you not to do, do not discuss the Brexit. You have other occasions to do that. Here you have a unique <laughs> occasion to discuss what you can really do about that. And with this I would normally now pause, sit with you, relax, enjoy the discussion and maybe then only get up here to say a thank you note at the end. Now, it so happened that one of my colleagues, head of department for legal information, Maya Capello, had a very urgent family matter and could therefore not come. So I will take that seat and I will stay within the discussion. But the rest is now in the good hands of Johannes Studinger, our moderator of today, chair of UniMay and UniMay Europe, Uni Europe, and also a long-lasting, unfortunately, his last year, president of the advisory committee of the observatory. And I can say he was a particularly good chair of the advisory committee and he's very skilled in guiding complicated discussions. Johannes. Uh, next to Ross, we have Gilles Fontaine, who has the um, analyzes department, if I may say so, and puts the economics together and will, <coughs> together with, um, with Suzanne, who replaces uh, Maya, give us always at the beginning of each session um, uh, a starting statement <coughs> to put us on, on the same level of information to, to introduce the, the discussion. Um, to my left is um, Harriet Finney, Director of External Affairs from the British Film Institute. Um, <coughs> And Susanne, you already know. And next to Susanne, you have uh, Maria, Maria Donde, who is the head of international content policy of Ofcom. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for coming and uh, uh, participating. And last but not least, Alejandro uh, Flores, general manager of uh, 100 Balas, which is a uh, subsidiary of Media Pro. So, really into the business. <laughs> <laughs> 
interesting mix of business perspective, observability perspective, regulatory perspective, and agency uh, perspective that helps to drive the industry. Um, what we will do is we will spend the next about 20 minutes uh, looking at production um, and then move on to the issue of distribution of works. Um, when we have discussed this uh, among our panelists, we will then open the floor for questions so you can already uh, prepare yourself and don't be shy. Um, we have enough time, set enough time for, for questions. And then we'll take it back to the panel uh, and look um, at the issue of circul circulation of TV channels. Um, um, and there also we will foresee um, uh, opportunity for the audience to ask questions to the panelists and make comments. And then we give it back again to uh, the panelists to make a form of closing statement looking a little bit uh, into the long term future. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's start with the first session um, where we are looking at the prospects, challenges, opportunity of productions post-Brexit. And um, um, I would like to ask Gilles to start with uh, setting the floor from the economics perspective. Good afternoon. Thank you, Johannes. Yes, regarding the topic on production, I would like to highlight three facts or three uh, elements regarding the <coughs> collaboration or cooperation, international collaboration for production. The first one, maybe the first zone of impact to be discussed, are of course co-productions. Um, we are talking here about uh, uh, between 30 and 40 um, co-production per year involving uh, the, the UK with uh, apparently a slight downward trend and co-production being uh, made or taking place mainly really with France, with Germany and with uh, Ireland. So to me the first uh, potential zone of impact are co-production. The second one which is uh, maybe linked to the first one is uh, the access to uh, European funding and in particular access to um, Creative Europe funding as it can be a, a trigger uh, to build uh, international production um, uh, projects. And here uh, um, figures from the BFI suggest that um, over 120 million pounds have been uh, invested to support UK um, uh, projects uh, since the beginning of the media uh, program. And the third dimension um, is what is, uh, uh, is the unique ability of the UK to attract big production budget from the US, what uh, the so-called uh, inward investment. Inward investment do not include only big budget, but they do uh, uh, are part of this project, mainly originating from the US. And what seems interesting here is that this inward investment from the US big studios do generate generate work to generate work much beyond uh, than, the, than the UK and in particular it generates works for talents outside the UK and to give you an example uh, a recent uh, Screen Islands uh, Alliance study estimated that about one third of the talents working in the visual effects sector were origin originating from uh, outside uh, the UK and from within Europe. So again, uh, a unique ability to attract big US budget, but which is also benefiting to, from, to talents from outside the UK. So this will be, in my view, three uh, possible zones of impact or, or discussion uh, regarding production. Thank you, uh, Gilles. And uh, Suzanne, if you could complement with the regulatory aspects of um, production and co productions. Well, I will try my best. Um, going to co-production is actually a good starter because it's almost cheerful. The EU doesn't have a major legal instrument here. I mean, it's the Council of Europe who has it, namely um, the European Convention on Cinematographic Co-Productions, now renamed after um, the revision in 2017 into the Council of Europe Convention on Co-Production. 
the revision still is in need of uh, signatures and ratifications, including from the UK. But uh, it's there, it's not impacted. Actually, what's also there, and uh, also at least uh, <coughs> interesting for co-producing, um, is Eurmarsh, where the UK mm -hmm. is not a member. It had a very brief membership, I think, for three years, somewhere in the 90s. Other than that, we are actually getting to EU rules. And I would like to introduce them to you in the spirit of the EU is a club. Mm -hmm. It's a club that does pursue the digital, digital single market. And as every club, it has rules. It uses all sorts of means to make this club pleasant and to pursue this goal to the satisfaction of its members. And um, there I will come back to and I will always highlight a little bit what these club rules are. For the production of works, we are talking about state aid rules. State aid rules which kick in if a country wants to promote um, production by setting up a scheme, also when it alters a scheme. And those rules are of course um, such that the Commission needs and wants to control them to make sure that there is uh, still fair competition. And the Commission does so according to the 2013 cinema communication. I will not get into the details here, but just to remind you there is a certain limit of how much you can finance of a co-production. It's uh, of a production, it's up to 50% for co-productions, it's higher. There um, are the same limits for distribution and promotion of audiovisual works if you want to promote that with state aid. And then there are exceptions if you have particular difficult audiovisual works. Then you have additional limits as to um, obligations on territorial spending. And you know, it's a rich package of rules. There is also a lot of case law. And all of this will, of course, not be um, applied anymore. It doesn't need to be applied anymore to the UK. The UK will not have to notify when it wants to uh, do anything to its state aid system. Now, I think one question that we could have is maybe the first one is, is surprising. Isn't that a good thing? You are free from limitations. Not me to answer that. What I, it's up to me is to tell you, well, this is the part where you have limits because you want to promote something with your own money. But there are also situations where you, as a UK player, can get money, state aid, from the EU. And there we are getting into the EU funding schemes, and there are a lot of them. And uh, Gilles mentioned already the Creative Europe Media Program as one. And uh, indeed, there it will be uh, very difficult to obtain in the future uh, money from. The Creative Europe Program is open also to non uh, EU countries, but only under certain settings. The idea is, for example, if a country wants in the long run to access to the European Union, then this is already a sort of co a cooperation that can lead the way. You can also become an EU um, funding uh, recipient if you manage to have bilateral contracts that allow for that. That is the case of Switzerland, or for multiple states, it's the case in EFTA. There are neighboring policies that might make this happen. So there are ways, but none seems now to be a, a clear-cut case. The professionals I would expect in this room will, given the figures that Jill mentioned, tell that this would be very difficult if all this funding wasn't there anymore. And it's not only the funding from the Creative Europe Media Program. It's also um, from, for example, the European Regional Development Fund, the European Social Fund, Horizon 22. At 2020, and you have more of um, those schemes listed in our applications. <coughs> and the other, um, of course, it, it might not all stop by tomorrow. There might be transition periods, and there's a lot of discussion about this, but in the end, that's one of the uh, negative consequences if you get out of a club, one of the benefits that might not apply anymore. It was mentioned the circulation 
freedom of circulation for um, the creative industry, that's almost uh, by nature a very mobile one. It's an international one. Talent is recruited from everywhere to everywhere, so this is a problem that I think will uh, not only be with the UK, but you'll have it also for the other European uh, Union countries that stay. It won't be so easy anymore to get uh, those people on board that you used to get on board. And you might need new rules as to visa requirements, but even if you have all of this in place, you can count on things becoming more costly, taking more time, and being also administratively more burdensome. But nothing of this is a big surprise. And I think, nevertheless, these are some very important issues for the production part. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Gilles, for, for uh, this introduction. So we heard uh, there, are, there are various issues we, we should uh, look into, and my proposal is that we first go into looking at production from a business point of view. Um, we have two gentlemen here that represent business, and. Um, <coughs> And as both Jill and uh, Suzanne have pointed out, um, the possibility of business to come together as business partners uh, in Europe, um, including the UK, um, is is a very important feature of of our European um, of our European culture. Um, from the outset, I would like to say, of course, we will talk a lot about business, but this also is in the spirit of. Europe being um, a very diverse but also a set of common values and intercultural exchange that flows through uh, the co-production um, uh, ecology. And um, there are two aspects to that is the ability of businesses to cooperate easily um, with a lot of um, uh, uh, ability to, uh, to uh, get funding from various sources, private, public, come together, but also to pool resources, talent and crew, uh, to make the best possible creative, but also technical um, uh, work that then can be um, presented to the audience. Now, if you look at some of the remarks that industry and several stakeholders of the industry have been made, I would just um, quote uh, from um, a submission by the Federation of Entertainment Unions to the UK Culture, Media and Sport Committee. Um, they are saying many parts of the entertainment industry have developed potentially globalized workforces who expect to spend parts of their working lives based outside their country of birth and this enables exchange of skills and creative ideas which have helped to make the UK a cultural hub at world level. This is what Jill pointed at. And now, in, in, in you know, looking at Brexit, a lot of uh, business organizations, MPA, CAC, IFTAS, Directors UK, FEU, but also European organizations like EBU, SEPI, FIAF, and the unions express their concern about after Brexit, how um, productions can be put together, moving talent, investment, and businesses uh, across, across borders. Um, and this is the, the first questions I would like to direct to Ross. From your perspective, what situation do you expect? Will it be co-production? Will it be more complex? Will it be um, more cumbersome? Or do you see um, you know, a future win-win situation? And what would be the needs of the industry looking at both UK and EU regulators and funding bodies? Thank you, uh, Johannes, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I'd, I'd share the kind of optimistic tone of Susanna's introduction. I think clearly co-productions are going to be retain their importance, probably grow their importance. This is a fairly well um, a well educated audience, and then those are stuff already. It's just briefly to say that you know, with the, the arrival of um, international global comp competitors um, coming from outside the traditional broadcasting sector. That has had an impact on the, the budgets that we need, um, and it will, I think, drive traditional broadcasts to do more and more co-production, uh, and generally to kind of look over the fence and copy techniques from the cinema sector, like <coughs> pre-sales, like co-productions, uh, etc. Um, two points where I think Brexit will touch on this. Um, firstly, it's a, 
this article of faith uh, among some parts of the political class uh, in the UK. Um, but once the UK has finally left the common commercial policy, um, as the country will, will make new trade deals um, with other parts of the world. Um, and that's been briefly discussed within the audiovisual sector. Harriet, I know, has a, a point of view on this. Um, I think, I think there's, a, there's a general view beginning to be formed now that when you think of the timelines involved here, um, of the UK being in, within the, the CCP for the foreseeable future, uh, of trying to get mandates at national and international level, um, and then the politics of predominantly agriculture around chlorinated chicken and what have you, um, that it's going to be really quite a long time before we actually see any international trade deals agreed and ratified, mm. let alone the question of whether we, as the audiovisual sector, have any business being in those deals, which is another debate altogether. Um, I've, I've heard a couple of people say that in the sector, well, actually, the more sensible thing to do is to look for um, specific bilateral co production um, treaties, which, from our point of view, ideally would include not just film, um, but also high-end television and the why not medium in television um, as well. Um, so I think that is something that will be developed further um, in the UK in the, the, the next few months. And the second point would be, kind of touching on what you were saying, Johannes, about people. Because it's, very, it's one thing to kind of have a, a deal between financiers and producers about making a program. Um, but if you can't actually get the people in to make it, um, then you're going to struggle. And I think the we're expecting a migration white paper next week uh, from the UK government, although it's been promised before and, and, and delayed. I think in, in general it's, it's rather simpler to explain um, you know, the, 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 the free movement regime for an employee, because you can say, in case somebody who's earning more than £30,000 a year is, is, is free to come in or whatever, um, you would have a, a special scheme for some um, uh, you know, classes of employees have been talked about a special scheme for agricultural labourers, fruit pickers, etc. Um, the concern that some of us have in, in the sense is, is there political will on governments to have a, a separate scheme also for creative freelancers? Because this is a situation where you could be on a shoot somewhere uh, in the UK and your, um, your, your, your cameraman falls ill uh, and the the best available replacement is a Hungarian guy. Um, so you have to go and get special approval for him to come in and work on this. Um, and it's, it's, it's a more complicated system uh, to explain to government officials who are under incredible pressure uh, to sort out the bigger picture um, of free movement. Uh, but I think that's something we're going to have to work on um, once this white paper is published to make sure that the sector which is characterised by an awful lot of freelancers, by an awful lot of really quite short-term project-based work uh, that we need to be recognised within that free movement regime as well, or whatever comes after the free movement, we need to be within that regime as well. Yeah, thank you, Ross, and, and certainly that's a um, concern also for, for those people who want yeah, actually to, to participate, and I think that's, that's a common interest of business and, and people working in industry that look at a, you know, a transition that is as smooth as possible. Um, but looking at from from um, from thousands of years, if I may, I can go from, from your maybe explaining a couple of words of the nature of your business, of and, and how and how this you expect this to impact and, on, and, and what, what what the prospects are for you cooperating with UK counterparts in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, despite I'm now a TV producer, I have been working for many years on the TV management side, working for public companies, for American companies, and uh, I think one of the main things that uh, Johannes just said uh, is what we should have in mind about uh, what the UK means for the audiovisual market. Um, you said it's, uh, it's an audiovisual hub, and it's true, it's not only that, it's a provider for the rest of the country, it's not only for formats, but also for a finished program or as a co-producer. The UK is a very big co-producer in different countries, for films, especially for films. So, um, the broadcasting quotas that uh, we have to accomplish in the, in the European Union, um, most of the times are covered with UK product, which uh, some producers could think maybe the Brexit is an opportunity, 
uh, if the TVs or the platforms have to accomplish to, to, to these uh, quotas and, and they cannot get the content from the UK, so this would create more industry. I'm not pretty sure about that because uh, I think a UK market is uh, an audiovisual market that goes a couple of steps ahead of the rest of the, of the countries. So it's uh, like a mirror where we can uh, guess how the future is going to go and uh, it has always been a, a pretty nice provider, especially in the side of Finnish programs that there's a big market of uh, buying and selling. But if we go to co-production from a film production perspective, uh, in the case of Spain, these international co-productions are regulated under co-production agreements. Nowadays in Spain we don't have any bilateral agreement with the UK and all co-productions are approved by the ICAA, which is the Spanish regulatories, like the BFI. Uh, they approve any UK co-production based in the co-production agreement of the European Council, which includes further countries than the European ones. Uh, the ICAA and the BFI must approve any co-production based in the information exchange. Nowadays, any production that wants to receive tax in incentives in Spain and is made in an international co-production way, uh, okay in this case, uh, it, must have, it must have the, the approval of the ICAA for that co-production. So, uh, therefore, it must comply with the artistic and technical requirements stipulated in the co-production agreement. So, what is happening to us as Spanish producers? Uh, that we have uh, projects that uh, could go ahead in a <coughs> co-production uh, way with the, U with the UK. We have a couple of, of, of real cases in MediaPro uh, of possibilities to co-produce films uh, between Spain and UK with the Spanish and British talent. Um, we, we have consulted the ICAA about this because we, we, we normally make this kind of consults and, and the, the, the response that we get is that uh, they don't have a clear idea of what is going to, to happen at least 10 days ago regarding co-productions which is a lot of time <laughs> uh, for the time being uh, they put precaution on all the uh, approvals that they make uh, in which there's a participation of this personnel or, or filmed in the UK uh, and then are being approved in a conditional way, including a warning uh, uh, that uh, tells that uh, maybe in the future this could change. So just a couple of conclusions from, from this recent experience. Spain is approving these uh, possible co-productions provisionally on a conditional way since, since they do not know what will happen with the validity or, or not uh, of the UK in our case. Uh, in the Council of Europe and what would happen to cost price. And second and most important for business proposers and as producers, this situation generates a lot of doubt and insecurity. Since we could be left without one European nationality and without guarantees in the co-production approval. This would mean uh, not good consequences like not being able to release a film or not obtaining financing sources from uh, TV channels or platforms that have to commit to European uh, uh, productions but if you don't give them guarantees that the, the content you are giving to them is uh, European for production, uh, it could be a problem. Um, finally, I think this affects whoever single fiction production that uh, wants to receive the Spanish tax income uh, incentive uh, under the UK co-production uh, agreement. Thank you so much, uh, and Alejandro. So there, what we hear from business there is um, positive uh, outlook, but uh, some some worries, legitimate worries about some yeah. uncertainty, uh, in particular when it comes to um, how to access funding, in which scope. Uh, also some potential roadblocks to uh, bring talent and crew together. Now from an from a agency point of view, if I may say so, Harriet, uh, who really wants to cherish the industry, the UK industry, of course, but also the wider European corporation, 
what do you see uh, as a possible um, way forward to, to continue to cherish um, original production, co-production within a European framework? Great, thank you. Um, so, in my job of external affairs at the BFI, I have, uh, one of the things we've done in the past year is set up something called the Screen Sector Task Force, we're actually going to speak here today, who are part of that task force. Um, and the aim of this group of people is to take a very, very long and very in-depth look at how the UK works with the EU and look at actually how we can continue what has been an extraordinary cultural and creative collaboration over so many years and something that I think none of us want to want to lose. Um, so a number of the areas obviously that we, we picked up on today are things that we've covered in quite a lot of depth as part of that group and also as part of our work um, with our Department of Culture, Media and Sport um, and also the Department for Exiting the EU in the UK. So I, I've got <coughs> some comments on some of these pieces which are either from a BFI perspective or from a, where we are with the UK government at the moment. Um, so well, first I'll just cover off on the co-production. As you say, obviously we have the comfort of the fact that we are and will continue to be members of the Council of Europe. Um, you mentioned the fact that the UK has not yet ratified. I know that the UK government is very keen to do that as soon as possible, so I think there will be news on that fairly shortly. Um, in terms of the eligibility of both the content and talent, in terms of looking at the co-production, um, certainly within the UK, the cultural test used to say just it was only eligible for EEA content and talent, but actually we've amended that already um, as part of the Brexit process and, and we've, that now says that it's for UK and EE talent. So there is absolute certainty that within the UK, European talent will continue to be able to work and will be able to access that, um, those cultural tests uh, for your talent. Now, in terms of where we are, as long as there is a deal agreed in the UK, there is also, until the end of the withdrawal period, so until the end of 2022, UK um, talent will be thought of as EEA. So in terms of the issues you've been having, actually, hopefully, we will still be EEA for the purpose of those agreements until the end of 2020. And what happens next is, is to be negotiated. Um, so hopefully some of that uh, gives a, a degree of comfort. I think also um, mentioned that co-production, the levels of co-production in the UK have been on the decline and this is something that we are incredibly aware of at the BFI to the extent that we uh, launched an independent film commission um, which ran over the course of a year and one of the very big areas that we looked at is actually in terms of sustaining a very healthy environment for independent film is that we need to see more co-production, particularly in the environment of, of where we are in terms of Brexit and, and Europe. So I know that Oldsburg SPI published a report saying just 23 of the UK um, percent of UK co-productions, um, 23 percent of independent films are co-production. Obviously, we would like to see many more going into the future. So we are working with the UK government uh, in terms of looking at ways of making this possible. Um, so these are just some of the some of the areas picked up on there. Just a other couple of things to pick up on talent. I mean, for us, and I mean across every single one of the creative industries, this issue around movement to talent is absolutely critical, and particularly because our workforce tends to be this makeup of about 50% freelance talent. Um, it's something again we've been working on incredibly closely with both DCMS and with the Department for Exiting the EU. Um, you may or may not have picked up that in May there was a joint announcement between the Commission and uh, the UK Government which set out a series of topics to be talked about during the negotiating period. It also set out the possibility of discussing three separate cross-cutting accords and there is one there for culture and education. Now it's not picked up specifically within um, the withdrawal agreement or within um, the uh, political declarations last week, but there is a lot of talk around culture and education and actually a continued dialogue. And for both culture and education, that movement of <coughs> and talent access to those networks is absolutely critical. Um, so I think in terms of being able to make a case for movement both ways, for particularly that short-term worker, um, we hope that, that there's a, a, well, a lot of work going on there and we have the ability as to say there is a Brexit uh, immigration white paper out soon so we'll be feeding into that as well making sure that there is an arrangement that works for everybody across 
the EU. Um, also critical to make, making films is being able to make your equipment um, easily, as well as your people. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to note that there are actually two agreements that the EU has at the moment which do actually already uh, make um, a, a condition uh, of them is around the movement of cinematographic equipment, and that's with Japan and Chile. So there is already actually um, some evidence that this may well be possible as well, because I think that obviously is an equally important part. Um, I'll then make one other, and we'll, I think we'll cover funding in quite a lot of detail during the distribution bit, so I won't touch on Creative Europe now. Um, but state aid, just to say as well that I think there have been a number of um, political declarations, very, very high level, really, since the beginning, well, and certainly since the Prime Minister's Mansion House speech back in March, which made it very clear that there is no intention to deviate from the current state aid regime at all. And I think, I mean, that is certainly an area that we would like to give comfort, that there is, you know, the tax reliefs are working incredibly well in the UK, but there is absolutely no interest or um, appetite for reopening those or changing the state aid regime for the sector. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Harriet, for, for, for your comments. And um, I agree. I, I propose we, let's say, part for the moment uh, the issue of Creative Europe. Uh, it will come up uh, in, in our next uh, block uh, on, on, uh, on distribution, which, uh, which we will uh, move quickly to in, in a minute. But before doing, be, before doing uh, that, I, I'd like to give the opportunity <coughs> to Maria and it, uh, to, to comment on, on what has been said, in particular from a regulatory point of view. Um, some things that have been said point to the need, and maybe say it is one issue, where it appears um, there is a big need of extended cooperation between EU and UK post-Brexit, um, the regulatory um, to, uh, cooperation to ensure a level playing field for both, for both players um, across uh, the channel. What, what would you think, how, from your perspective from Ofcom, how would you see that um, regulatory um, cooperation, you might pick up public funding, it doesn't have to be, but Thank you very much. Um, before I uh, move on to answer the question, I just wanted to say thank you very much to the Observatory for, for inviting us to participate in this. I just wanted to briefly mention that um, uh, where I first started in my current role, um, this room was the very room in which I attended my very first European uh, Brussels conference. So it's a pleasure to be back here and thank you very much to the, um, to the Bavarian representation for, for having us here as well. Um, may well be my last. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is probably the, the area in which, uh, to be fair, I, I will have the least to contribute to, to, to this debate, so I'll keep it brief. Um, as, far as, as far as production is concerned, there is not a great deal of um, oversight or regulatory responsibility that um, an organisation like Ofcom has in, in terms of uh, funding and, or um, even indeed questions of, of, of public service funding. Um, what we do, I suppose, is um, support and try to create um, uh, a, a, an environment in which uh, public service broadcasting um, domestically can thrive. And so we uh, currently, as well, with our new responsibilities over BBC, um, you know, are, are responsible for overseeing the way that that, that money is spent and, and, you know, ensuring that um, high quality standards and, and, and so on are, are met. Um, it, is, it is definitely the case that um, UK content has been um, uh, incredibly popular. Uh, for, for, UK, for EU audiences and, and even widely than that, um, I think that's that's partly also fed back into the system, which has allowed um, for uh, you know increased investment, increased um, funding, but also as you know as, as many uh, people already have mentioned, uh, because of the opportunities for, for UK producers, um, uh, program makers, filmmakers to to co cooperate and to produce. Um, uh, in collaboration with, with European partners. Um, we, we don't play, as I say, a, a huge role in that, but um, you know, there, there are associated areas of regulation which, which do relate to level playing fields and, and support of 
in general of, of European production, and, and those we are responsible for. Um, uh, the, the UK <coughs> reports, as everybody uh, as everybody else does, on on the amount of European content that um, that is um, um, that is provided for by our licensed mm. services. That tends to be. You know, a reasonable proportion. Uh, we don't always hit the, the majority, but um, for example, in, in on-demand content, the UK actually reports higher than the majority um, um, European content, and, and and there is also demand back from 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 the UK for for, for European content as well. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how much that will be affected, um, and, and and what kind of positive perspective we have, uh, but. And much of that really depends on, on continued alignment of, of regulations, which is slightly outside of our hands. Um, but I can certainly say that, you know, from, from, from our perspective, in terms of where, where existing audiovisual regulation um, is intended to support the European production, um, that is some, something on which we, you know, we, we work on and, and we work with our European uh, uh, counterparts in other regulators in terms of trying to ensure uh, as level playing field as possible. Yeah, I think, thank you so much, Miriam. And I think it, your, your reference to overseeing public service broadcasting is, is really important um, as public service broadcasting is one of the main funders for, for production and co-production. And, and the BBC is certainly one of the models that uh, is, is, a, is an example for, for other countries. And so uh, let's say uh, a good shepherd in the future is not only over the BBC and the other um, public uh, licenses is, uh, is, is, is very much welcome, I guess, but also it's, it's good for the European, uh, for the European uh, community of, 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 um, of broadcasters um, as well public as, as, as uh, private. Um, moving, having had now a first exchange on, on production, and we have seen there, there is optimism, but there is also a little bit of concern regarding um, the smooth uh, transition in, in, in terms of uh, investment and, and talent and services, to some extent equipment. Now more to actually the um, uh, independent issue of uh, distribution. Uh, Ross mentioned pre-sales, so that's probably one of the topics which mm -hmm. underlines so much that you cannot look at production isolated from distribution. It is all bound together, and that's why, you know, um, having just one block production and then pretend that there is another block of uh, distribution isolated would not be very wise. So, uh, I'm, and Ross, uh, thank you for that. Already hinted at, at the very beginning. But before going back to the panelists, I would ask again uh, Gilles and then Suzanne to to make some remarks on the observatory's observations on. On what what is uh, up for grabs when it comes to uh, to um, to distribution? What we need to focus on, what we should focus on, uh, in engaging here between our panelists and later with the audience. Okay, um, <coughs> regarding the circulation of audiovisual programs, it will not be a surprise for anyone to uh, see that um, the UK is a strong net exporter of audiovisual programs to the rest of the of the EU. From two specific insights and I'm looking at the share of uh, European works and uh, European non-national works available on, on, in cinemas, on TV and TVOD, measures in number of films. Uh, first element, the share of European non-national programs in the UK is rather lower than in the rest of the EU on average. Uh, put in other words, it means that uh, the share of European um, uh, works in cinemas, on TV and VOD is rather met by national programs rather than by European national programs when compared to the rest of the EU countries. And the second aspect, which is uh, uh, the export part, uh, is the fact that again measures the number of films. Uh, the UK is the second most important exporter in terms of number of films in cinemas and on television uh, in the rest of Europe and it's the first exporter when you look at TVOD or at VOD generally speaking and what you look, when you look at, uh, uh, more generally at television series. So again, 
a position of a strong exporter uh, rather than of an importer of, a, uh, of your audiovisual works. Thank you, Gilles. Suzanne? Well, I want to get you back to the club feeling. And uh, this time it's about the fundamental freedom, the free circulation of European films and uh, other audiovisual works. Now, of course, it's a freedom, so it's a right that you can use, it's not really an obligation. On the other hand, the club is aiming for a digital single market, so it's not very nice if it's only national films that circulate, or even worse, if it is um, films from outside European Union that make the screen. So there is then, and we have heard this in the first contribution, there is then of course a policy means to change a little bit what the club members do and these are the quotas. And just again to recall, for the television you have to have at least 50 majorities or more than 50% for European works, might be national works, but at least it shouldn't be coming from outside. 10% transmission time or 10% uh, programming budget from independent producer, another important quota. And then now we will have, um, after the revision is transposed, also another percentage and that is 30% uh, in catalogs um, on on-demand um, audiovisual media services and also a requirement of prominence for these services. Now this could be um, indeed important also with regard uh, to the, um, the Brexit, to being out of the club. It could be. Is it really? Is it really? So, I come to that in a moment. I just want to mention what I would have almost forgotten, that now we have also another tool, and that is that you can have the uh, on-demand uh, television and media service providers established in another member state participate um, financially in uh, financing if they um, if they target your country. So there is an, this option of the levies which is new and which is maybe also an, an interesting aspect again if a service is uh, originally maybe not even a European service. Now, is out of the club a problem? Uh, maybe it's not if we could and can rely on the European Convention on Trans uh, Transfrontier Television. You've seen that in my introduction, a uh, convention that didn't have much of a life and now everyone recalls it. Because if um, your work qualifies as European under the convention, then this is a reference that's picked up by the uh, Audiovisual Media Service Directive and it doesn't matter whether you are an EU member state or not. So it seems like we are fine, yes and no. A, it only covers um, television, it doesn't cover on demand. Remember we didn't have an alignment on, of the instruments, so there is a, a big part uh, where work, European works are not saved as European under the European Convention. Yeah, this uh, situation will actually further aggravate when there is now um, the new um, percentage for the uh, catalogs, which uh, so far, well, is not yet uh, making, setting the two tools, the um, EU directive and the convention so far apart, but will even then in the future. Now, in a way, the UK can say we do not have an obligation anymore for video on demand. Maybe that's uh, not so bad. Uh, but we might benefit from the fact that others have this obligation still because they might be keen to use UK content. That's one uh, way one, one, one can think. And one can also say we are also not too worried about the European Convention maybe at some point running into a problem of existence because of the non-alignment, the scope being more and more different. Because if this were to happen, we can still focus even more on becoming back to the magic work on co-productions. As soon as we're then co-producing with someone who is still a member of the EU, we also get um, the label EU Works. And uh, that helps then again with regard to the quota and to being in demand. This 
Whether this will, of course, uh, happen or not, I don't know. If it were to happen, it would have the side effect that it would also turn these works into works eligible maybe for further funding under the various national schemes of the EU country, which gives the European label and also to a film which is co-produced uh, with uh, uh, the United Kingdom. So this a little rough sketch of where we stand. Yeah, thank, thank you for the rough sketch. Uh, I, hope, I hope you're not in for a rough ride, but uh, um, the, the, the general question I have to the panel and then who, after the panelists have introduced the discussion, I would like to open up to questions but also comments, of course, from the floor is, is it business as usual? Can we hope for business as usual when we look at, um, at the definition of um, what will be a European work? Is there, is there a prospect of a, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the criteria where UK works could still qualify. Um, the EU is the second biggest uh, exporter destination of UK. <coughs> Um, works after the US, so access is really important. Um, we want to maybe also to focus on uh, funding um, for uh, distribution and looking at the importance of programs like Creative Europe and the possibility, yes or no, for the UK to be uh, not only a member but also an active driver of the synergy effects that we all know from the reports on the implementation of the creative media in the UK but also by the Europe. Um, so um, going again first to my two colleagues from the business side, Ross, um, will it be, do you expect business as usual largely or do we need to, to look to our regulators on both sides of the channel to, to step up uh, as soon as possible work to, to make sure that, that we get as close as possible to business? I think in the short term, um, we're, we're quite optimistic about the, um, the UK and the quotas point. I think it was striking, it was one of the few points of uh, alignment between the European Commission paper on what happens in the event of a no-deal Brexit and the UK government paper on, on the same thing. But I think the UK government paper came later and basically cross-referred back to the Commission paper. Um, and this is something which is, is, is a concern shared by many people in the, in the sector. Um, it's important for discovery. You have discovery channels which are um, based outside, outside the UK. They, they've met the obligation or approached the obligation to have a majority proportion of European content where practical. Um, we've, we've done that largely. You know, UK content has been an important part of that um, story. Uh, it's also, I'm not speaking for them, it's also very, very important for uh, the UK Indies, PAX. Uh, and of course for big, big parts of the ESP um, system like ITV Studios and the BBC. So and that's been made, point been made repeatedly um, to the British government that you know, whatever you're doing in the future, um, don't develop an audiovisual policy which is in contradiction to that of the EU because that will mean that we no longer qualify um, under the language of AUS um, because there's a, there's, a, there's a second tier to it. Yes, much about the convention is part of it but also having uh, policy broadly aligned, I can't the exact wording, um, but we, we shouldn't be in contradiction anyway to EU policy. Um, and that's actually kind of partly driven the conversation we've had again around possible future trade deals. Um, let's not go off chasing uh, a very ambitious deal um, and, and accidentally um, undermine what we have in the EU because that is the bread and butter of the industry at the moment is the ability to have our content counted towards the uh, EU quotas for broadcasts around Europe. Thank you, thank you Ross. Alicante, do you share Ross's um, general optimism that at least in the short run, uh, European producers can work seemingly the same level of interaction with the UK counterparts in production? Hopefully, yes. Uh, I think uh, the system less works and maybe we, it's a good moment to, to, to improve it because probably it's something that it's, uh, has, ha, has always a place but uh, uh, we should try to, to, to in, the, in the audiovisual market keep things uh, as, <coughs> as much similar as they are now and make it uh, business as usual because uh, big changes will affect uh, many 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 other things I mean uh, I 
exist in, in what uh, the UK uh, content uh, means for the rest of the markets, especially for the TV channels, in terms of uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of content. In the case of Discovery in Spain, uh, Discovery is providing content for two free to web channels, uh, one, one pay TV channel and three Eurosport channels. Uh, that wouldn't be uh, possible if it's not because it, they're covered by a mother company that provides with a big about amount of, of content. And that, um, that makes a curious situation because in the case of Spain you cannot have a, 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 the, the, the property of a TV channel if you are not uh, a European country. You can only have up to 25%. So that <coughs> makes uh, the only possibility to have new channels in Spain with Spanish companies. What has happened in these years is that those Spanish companies they have realized that they have to feed the monster 24 hours a day and that's very expensive. Uh, so uh, it's curious because those companies that have the, the ability and the capability to, 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 uh, to, to, to put ahead the channels and make them profitable are those that are not allowed to do it. So uh, in the middle of all of this, it's the UK that it's the most uh, similar to American content provider that counts as a, as a European production. I can tell you a case, it's the Harry Potter case. In, then in Spain we also have a, 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 a rule that 5% of, of channel incomes have to be uh, used for financing uh, films. So uh, TV channels have uh, included in this quota films like Harry Potter that has been produced in the UK, they made an agreement with Warner Bros. three years before the, uh, the, the movie was produced, so they were financing that movie. The cost of the movie for the, for the TV channel is so big because it's a blockbuster that covers a big part of that obligation that other ways could be uh, an, an issue, a problem for the channel. Yeah, thank you, Alejandro. So we hear alignment is uh, something uh, industry hopes uh, in, in order to uh, to get as close as possible to to uh, business as usual. But also, it underlines the importance of UK content for distribution uh, across across the European uh, continent. Um, and in, in that distribution, you have, of course, you have the you have blockbusters, but you also have a very vibrant, interesting, and uh, uh, well-established independent sector. Now, the independent sector um, also has concerns um, when it comes to um, having access to the market through uh, um, uh, distribution uh, deals. And um, one of the element uh, is, uh, of course, <coughs> the Creative uh, Europe program, which we mentioned. So, um, Harriet. Turning to you, um, the importance of those schemes, um, not only for independent uh, productions, but for the buyer um, um, uh, economy. Um, how do you see? How is 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 this is this the way we can hope for that the UK will be an active partner in, in creative Europe? Is that's the best possible outcome we can hope for? Um. I will talk about the creative book. Can I just make two responses to the other um, uh, speakers first? It's just I want to say one thing that I know obviously the UK is an incredibly strong net exporter, but I also want to say that we are also an incredibly big importer of EU and European film in the UK. And last year we spent £1 billion um, pounds on the acquisition of European non UK TV and film content, which I think is not insignificant. Um, and the other thing, uh, just to say, in terms of the AVMS piece and business as usual, is to say that the UK and certainly the BFI as part of the EFADS group, we've been an incredibly active role throughout the whole of the AVMS negotiation period and it is very much the intention of the UK government to, once that is all goes through, is that it will be adopted and, and written into the UK. So we will be at a point of complete alignment 
um, and there is no intention to go in and tinker with it uh, once it's sitting on our uh, law book. So just in terms of that conflict around alignment to business as usual. Um, coming on to Creative Europe, I mean, obviously for independent film, the circulation of independent film in Europe, I mean, just can't underestimate the impact of Creative Europe. I mean, in terms of just looking at the number of films, for example, released in cinemas in the UK last year, independent films, 760 films, and there's 126 of those were non-UK European films, and that's actually a huge amount that is going into UK cinemas, and an awful lot of that will be supported through the Creative uh, Europe programme. Um, I also think it's important to say that there is, interesting, there is a, there is a growing demand particularly driven by the proliferation of quite specialist niche platforms um, for European and international film content. We at the BFI have the BFI Player, which is our own online platform, but there are also new companies such as Mubi entering into this market. And um, both us at the BFI, but also uh, Mubi, have received quite significant uh, amounts of funding from Creative Europe to help support um, the distribution of, of film on their online platforms. Um, so, I mean, for us, it would be it would be very, very, very sad if we were not able to remain a member of Creative Europe after 2020 when the new program starts. What we do have at the moment, as long as there is a deal, is we do have the certainty that the UK will be uh, fully signed up, fully paying in member until the end of the withdrawal period at the end of 2020. Um, and any project that even overrun that period will actually be underwritten um, and, and completely eligible as long as they're signed within that period. So we have a degree of comfort, hopefully, on the basis of a deal um, there. Um, and we are working very, very hard again in terms of looking at the shape of that new programme as well um, and hoping that we will be able to be part of that. So the UK government has made it very clear in a number of high-level statements that the ongoing participation in these programmes is an absolute priority. Yeah, thank you, Harriet. And, and turning to the other cornerstone, uh, uh, more to the ABMS uh, side, uh, negotiated, reviewed, um, um, good work from, I guess, uh, I would say, all of the EU institutions and stakeholders to bring it to a successful conclusion. Uh, Ofcom will have a bigger role in overseeing it. Can, can you project a little bit how you see that as a cornerstone for cooperation between the EU and the UK? Uh, certainly, um, thank you. Uh, so, yes, we to some extent also had um, uh, you know, contributed and, and played a role in, in, in following and, and to some extent trying to input into the negotiation process for the ABMS directive. Um, that necessarily changed a little as a result of the 2016 vote, uh, but I think regulators as a group and as a whole, um, and we have played our role in that context as well, have commented on um, an <coughs> in the development of the, uh, of the relevant obligations. Um, in, in addition, it's worth noting that um, as part of our membership of the European um, Special Advisory Group on Audiovisual ERGA, uh, to the Commission, uh, we have also worked with our European partners to try to understand the implications of the new provisions um, and to try to understand how regulators will need to work together in order to, um, in order to, you know, deliver the the very ambitious goals of some of the the new provisions. Um, in particular, I'm thinking here of the of the um, the new allowance for the imposition of um, financial levies on, on, on services from other jurisdictions, which Suzanne mentioned. Um, that's going to require, you know, as yet unclear exactly how, but quite a lot of cooperation between regulators. And, and Ergo has just published a report highlighting those areas where cooperation will be absolutely crucial. Um, it, it will be very important for, uh, for that to happen, for, for there to be a um, a thoughtful and a practical arrangement between the EU and, and the UK because, because at the moment um, there are no real um, clear, uh, obvious uh, provisions for, for, for third party regulators to, to cooperate with, with EU regulators in relation to, to the kind of matters that the levies will, um, will bring up. And so I think, you know, we are, 
we are looking to see what the agreement is like in order to be able to start to talk about how we can, we can work together. Um, touching on, on perhaps the, the, the general cooperation point, um, it is also important for, for regulators, I think, that, that there is some, some form of alignment in order for us to be able to continue to work together more broadly. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear uh, actually the, the, the kind of discussion here today about, about alignment. Um, it is also our understanding that you know, in the event of a transition period being agreed, that the UK will be um, transposing the, the directive. Um, so we expect to begin working on that and begin discussing that with our fellow regulators as well. But it is also important as part of that that, that there is some form of agreement reached um, about the cooperation and the work of regulators at the moment, that is unclear. Um, uh, on an informal basis, I mean, I can say as well that, that you know, we work through different networks. There's, there's a, another record, uh, network of media regulators which are extremely active, and so we will continue to, to work with, talk to, and collaborate with our European counterparts, irrespective of any um, uh, arrangement made between the EU and the UK. But in terms of any kind of formal um, requirements for regulatory cooperation, that, that will be um, still to, to be answered. Um, just in terms of the actual um, processes and uh, looking forward to the, to the way that the Ofcom, well, thinking about how Ofcom currently applies the, the, the quotas requirements and how it's likely to do so in the future, um, it's probably just worth saying that um, we we constantly review the way that we uh, apply any set of um, enforcement obligations that we have. And in recent years, we've, um, we've done quite a bit to change the system that, that we use to collect data from, from our TV broadcasters to ensure that the information that is provided is um, more accurate and um, thus also improve the way that the UK um, reports that information back to the European Commission. Um, we have adapted the way that we gather information from on-demand services in particular to provide greater clarity to those. Um, and we've also identified the changes which will be required to our internal processes uh, in light of the revised provisions that we've already discussed. So, so we are committed to and are working quite hard on um, our own role in, in ensuring that the UK um, services comply with the requirements of the directive. Um, Generally speaking, I mentioned some of the some of the statistics. At the moment, we are sort of running at about an average of about forty percent um, for services of European content, um, and that goes up to fifty percent for on demand. As I said, um, we don't collect information about where uh, where the content comes from. So we are, I think it's I think it's fair to say anecdotally that we know that most of the European quotas are met through through UK content. Generally speaking. Um, the evidence that we've seen tends to suggest that most, uh, actually most um, viewers in, in most countries prefer to watch domestic content um, and so that's natural, naturally the case in the UK as it is in any other EU member state. Um, what I think is interesting um, is to ask the question of just how much those quotas are the reason for uh, the success of, of, of UK sales into the, the EU and I don't think that we have well, what's the, you know, we need a counterfactual, I guess. Um, and so, you know, I, I would have thought that to some extent, um, the popularity and the, and the high quality of UK origin content uh, might see us through, irrespective of, of whether or not the UK content does qualify. Although I should underline, my understanding is also that um, in, the short, in the short term and hopefully in the long term, uh, UK content will continue to qualify as, as, as European works as, as we expect it to do so, uh, irrespective of, of any other arrangements. So, um, you know, we'll have to see, um, as I say, in our role as, as trying to carry out whatever obligations and responsibilities we have in terms of keeping UK uh, production high through the BSB framework, we will continue to do that in, in any event. And, and so, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of how we see our role. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Maria. So we we had now our panelists uh, dig into the production and distribution prospects of uh, an environment, a positive environment, as much as we can hope for after post Brexit. I would like now.
to give the audience uh, the opportunity to shoot away questions or make comments, take part in, uh, in the discussion. Um, we, will, we will have a walking mic uh, in the room, so Edison is, is here to give those mic to um, um, members here. I mean, we have EU representatives, we have colleagues from regulators, we have business interests, uh, we have people who represent talent and crew, so there should be enough questions and uh, comments. Um, um, someone wants to break the ice? <laughs> Are you nervous? <laughs> this panel is really relaxed, so uh, you can be relaxed. But, uh, you should not shy away from asking a question. Yes, please go ahead. William um, Meyer from the German Association of Commercial Broadcasters, Comet. Um, just a tactical question Have you heard from many of your companies wanting to change license, for example, to be on the safe side? Um, so um, I think that's probably also one issue, and yeah, uh, for the rest I hope free movement will still apply, because I think we've worked on that so much. Thank you for that question. Actually, you're introducing already the next session where we look at the <laughs> circulation of TV channels, but that, that is a very, very important question. Maybe we collect one or two other questions or comments? Okay, very good. So now with this very shy audience, I go back uh, to my brave panelists and uh, we, we go into the next uh, section um, which is on uh, circulation of TV channels and you will put a very key question that actually is on my uh, on, on this paper too, so you will, you will get the, the, one of the first questions. But um, let's first uh, get the observative uh, the, um, the perspective of the observatory first, Jill and then Suzanne, and then we go back to the panelists, and then you can might think of whether you want to interact or not later on. Okay, well, the circulation and the establishment of TV channels, I think the figures are really uh, well known. Um, to put more uh, concrete example of the concept which was introduced by Suzanne on the uh, UK being the hub of audiovisual services, measures in terms of number of channels, uh, which is not exactly the same concept than the number of licenses, about 30% of the uh, television channels in the EU28 are established uh, in the UK, and the uh, uh, figures are uh, rather similar for on-demand services. What is specific about the UK, it's not the only country, but it's a concept of hub. It means that uh, a significant share of these TV channels and on-demand services, from an economic perspective and not from a legal perspective, primarily address another EU market. Uh, it makes uh, the UK the first hub. Uh, the UK is not the only hub in terms of uh, location of TV channel and on demand services addressing other countries. Other examples uh, include, for example, the Czech Republic or, uh, or France. Uh, and it means that uh, between 40 and 50 percent of the TV channels uh, and uh, on demand services established in the UK, again, from a pr uh, primarily from an economic point of view, target other countries. Um, as regards TV channel uh, and looking the other way around uh, on how many TV channels do target uh, the, the, the UK, uh, the number are quite negligible. It's not exactly the same thing from on demand services. And to start with um, uh, a, a strong example, um, uh, Netflix is one of the examples of on-demand services which is not licensed or notified in the UK but which of course uh, plays a key role on the UK market. Thank you, thank you Gilles. And now Suzanne, I mean this is a very technical 
issue now about um, um, broadcasters projecting themselves um, um, in, in, in the future. Uh, can you highlight a little bit the, the key issues we should address here in the panel, we should look at? I'll try. The main club rules here are actually from the Audiovisual Media Service Directive and from the SATCAP directive and if I may just go through the what I would call the good club rules you have right to reception and retransmission so you can access the market um, you are one stop shop so you are controlled only um, by one country that has the jurisdiction and according to the agreed EU standards and then you have this fiction of copyright clearance for satellite and cable retransmission. So you're going also uh, wider with your content than you would without these rules. You can, if you are in the uh, club, not really experience any stronger standards except if your home country where you are established wants to do that to you. And of course, third countries can experience um, the imposition of stronger standards. Now the question therefore is how can you remain in the club? Because that seems the most likely way of benefiting from these good rules. Well, um, you can possibly stay if you are a member to the convention, but then what applies to you are only the good club rules for broadcasting. And um, you are also left with much weaker enforcement mechanism, just in case anything goes wrong. So what can you do for the rest? Well, you would have to relocate in order to get a new um, ID from another club member that stayed. So this links up to the question that was um, asked earlier. Have people already gone to ask for licenses elsewhere? I read yesterday just that there was the first um, public announcement from the um, Broadcasting Authority of Ireland that they received the first application from a UK-based broadcaster. They did disclose who that was. So at least for this country it happens, um, maybe it happens elsewhere, maybe some of the participants can later fill us in. Now, if you don't remain in the club, what happens? We have heard about the the strong will of keeping the legal regimes aligned. So that seems good news. The same rules um, apply, at least for as long as no one feels on either side changing any of the rules. And of course, also you do uh, still have the same rules, but you do not have the rights that go along as a member of the club. So if I may use this picture, you are in a tennis club, you can uh, still play the same game, but uh, you will not play on the same court. A big challenge might happen when you have now the transposition of the device directive as to video sharing platforms. There, so far we have no UK uh, equivalent, but maybe the alignment goes so far to provide for that as well. And then so far what I have mentioned was all in the area of directives where because you had the transposition need you do have a UK set of rules that corresponds but if you move on to areas that are not harmonized by directive but through regulation then it looks different and there we have since 2017 the portability regulation so uh, the cross-border portability for online content services that you may freely enjoy them if you subscribe in um, your country of residence, which needs to be in the EU, and then enjoy it when you travel abroad and you want to use those services elsewhere. So no geo-blocking anymore for these services, but we do not know what will happen in the future, because again, here we are on a different legal instrument the regulation, and uh, this will really cease to apply directly in the UK with the uh, cut-off date. Thank you, thank you, Suzanne. So, in, in, in addition to um, the impact of not being, if I may use your term, in the club of the AMS, although alignment is, is as we hear, one, one of the key um, um, vectors for the future, 
Um, there are other issues due to the cable and satellite directive um, that is currently you know, this week, we hope, um, with good news coming to end of re 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 review. Um, but also, very important at the time, a very important uh, discussion at the European level, also. I know from experience in the UK, also very important, the portability regulation, um, as this was a clear benefit uh, uh, for citizens uh, in, the, in the European Union and, 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 and the UK. So, but going one by one and go back to the, to the issue of um, establishment, um, and here we hit again the wall of business as usual. Here it's probably not business as usual, but um, and, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, Ross, or to 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 um, to respond as a representative of, of your organization. But let's take more your um, uh, deep experience as a representative of the industry and, and look at the opportunities and needs for broadcasters at large. Um, in, in this new environment um, and, and the question of how they can access, distribute uh, in, in, in this new environment. Thank you. Um, well, I can answer Julia directly. Um, uh, Discovery hasn't yet taken a decision uh, as to any possible um, restructuring. We are uh, in common with any uh, company doing business internationally in the UK in broadcasting or anything. Uh, we are looking at scenarios uh, for a no-deal Brexit, obviously, uh, but we're still at the scenario planning um, stage, uh, and that won't change um, to the foreseeable, in the foreseeable future. Um, I think the, um, it was well put by, uh, by Mark Cole here um, in the European Parliament uh, a couple of weeks ago. He said all, all international companies have these plans in their bottom drawer, uh, and the question is, when you pull it out of the drawer, do you refresh it, etc. Um, so it wasn't us, it was in Dublin last week. Um, um, but uh, obviously that's a, you know, something which all uh, broadcasters are going to be looking at. I think in, in general, when you look at the, the impacts of, uh, of Brexit on, on licensing, um, I, I think the, the essay question has changed a couple of times uh, since June 2016. I mean, first and most obviously the AVMS directive itself has changed. Uh, and not necessarily in a way that that helps um, international commercial broadcasters. There was a, a real push uh, for more country station control on pretty much everything, um, and it ended up, I came in, probably in, in a reasonable place, but probably not as unambiguously pro-country of origin as early iterations of that directive had been. Um, secondly, there's been a wave of consolidation in the industry. Um, you know, some, some very high-profile mergers, uh, Discovery itself, um, we finalised the merger in uh, April of this year uh, with Scripps Interactive, um, which, among other things, in Europe has had the, the, the effect of making Warsaw a very important uh, centre of business for us uh, because of the, the previous Scripps ownership of, of TWN in, in, uh, uh, in Poland. Um, and then there's a the question of transitional deal, will it come through or, or not? Um, so the, the, the question keeps changing, the timelines uh, keep, 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 keep moving um, somewhat. Uh, and the, the other observation I make uh, on AVMS, and looking around the room, there's an awful lot of experience on AVMS, people here who've drafted it, given advice on it, you know, sought to renegotiate it as, as lobbyists or whatever. Um, so it's, basically the AVMS director has provided a fairly significant proportion of many retirement packages for people in this room, um, including, <laughs> including ourselves, Julie Valley Caesar. Um, so, um, but actually it's not just the EUS piece you have to look at. I mean, just as important potentially is, uh, is what we're doing about data transfer um, post-Brexit. Uh, you, you can't get adequacy under GDPR on Brexit day plus one. You, you probably can negotiate during a transitional period. If you think about the way the industry is moving in general, with OGT and SVOD services becoming more important. You know, by definition there, you're processing personal data and you're holding people's credit card details on file. Do you need to have a, a different data center in the UK from the one in mainland Europe, etc.? These are sort of things that companies are grappling with, um, uh, as well as the issue of, of, of licensing. Um, as you can imagine, it's, probably, it's also a massive IT project in terms of you know, updating your schedules and what have you. Um, so, yeah, there's a couple of general observations. I'm going to, well, while I have the microphone, if I may, 
just a, a, another observation about the impacts of, of Brexit on the content sector, uh, which is probably less obvious for those of you that aren't living or working in the UK, um, is on public service broadcasting and impartiality. Um, because the, uh, the yeah, I mean the, the BBC have almost impossible position here, um, which is how do you represent the, the views of a country um, when, let's, let's be clear, the creative industries in, in general were strongly on one side of the referendum. There was a, there was a poll taken of uh, people working in our sector uh, the week before the referendum, which is 96% of us were going to vote for Maine. Okay? So you've got you know, North Korean levels of, uh, <laughs> of, of plurality within the sector itself. And realistically, you'd expect you know, most political journalists and, and producers to, to, to reflect that view. Um, but then the country votes you know, more or less 50-50 um, on, on the issue. How do you reflect that on a political panel? Because it was easy to do impartiality a few years ago. You've got someone from the left, someone from the right, someone from the middle. Uh, they all had five minutes of airtime and then went on to the next item. But in, 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 in this environment where there is a, a much sharper division um, between those who basically to remain in and those who want to get out, uh, it's much harder to do, particularly when the weight of um, so-called expert evidence uh, is, is very one-directional. Uh, one of the most famous phrases from the referendum campaign from the Leave side was that people have had enough of expertise, right? We have enough of experts in this country. Um, but you then get to a situation where you, you, you might have the, the head of the IMF arguing in one case, and, and against the head of the IMF you have a, a backbench MP. Uh, it's, 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 you, you can see that the producers really grapple with this. You can see it on screen, you see them struggling uh, to maintain the balance issue. And I think it's a, it's a you know, for any other country who's tend to do Brexit, um, uh, it, you, it, it is a really, really difficult issue. Um, fortunately, we, we don't do news programs in the UK, um, but I can really sympathise with what the people at the BBC are having to do. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Ross. And um, maybe this time I would like to turn immediately to Ofcom because here you, you're touching on an issue where the role of cooperation is so tremendously important with this uh, massive amount of broadcaster hub in the UK targeting other European countries, how, how can we make sure, and we, I mean, basically you and, and the other regulators and, and authorities that, that industry is helped with, with being able to put the things out of the drawer or not, um, and with the implementation you already referred to, proposed, reviewed uh, pieces of <coughs> regulation set and, and ABMS, how can how can we, how can this transition be be helped? Um, so this is one of the you know the, the, the jurisdiction criteria of the uh, ABMS directive um, and the the role that the UK has played as a as a base and a hub for European services is the reason why Ofcom is so profoundly committed to and is such a constant proponent of. Uh, regulatory cooperation. Um, we uh, held a session in our last uh, regulators network meeting in October where we sat down with uh, EU regulators, non-EU regulators, the Council of Europe, the European Commission and we talked very, very openly and very frankly about questions of regulatory cooperation, what is mandated by the relevant uh, legislation, legislative um, vehicles, and what actually happens in reality in relation to the relationships that we have, in relation to the informal networks and processes and, and contacts that we that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, generally speaking, as a community, regulators believe we regulators believe that we are in a really good place in relation to um, working together to ensure that services um, are compliant in a way to, as to ensure the protection of audiences. That is our you know, fundamental um, kind of guiding uh, value and, and uh, an impetus. Um, we do a lot, of course, in order to, to, you know, to, to, to fulfill our commitments to support and promote production and, and industries and so on. But you know, really at the heart of a lot of our work is that kind of protection um, 
um, responsibility and we take that very, very seriously. So I think the idea that the falling away of, of a particular kind of um, obligation under, under the regulatory frameworks would necessarily lead to a, uh, you know, a difficulty for regulators to continue to work together to ensure that the relevant regulator with the relevant jurisdiction over a service um, applies that, 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 that relevant uh, legislation, I think is, you know, is, is, is a little bit incorrect. I think you know, we, we will continue to work together and I think um, protection of audiences and, and, and the various other responsibilities that we have will continue. Jurisdiction is a really complex matter under the directive and, and, and it's often confused with licensing, but the two are not the same. Um, the, so the different ways, of, so the, the AVMS directive says nothing about licensing. Well, it says a couple of things about it, but it, but, but it doesn't uh, require it, nor nor does it um, place it at, at the heart of the jurisdiction provisions. Um, different frameworks have been put into place by different uh, EU member states and non-EU countries um, in order to achieve a number of different public policy goals, including the management of spectrum and protection of audiences and so on. The UK has one framework, lots of other countries have different ones. And we, within the regulatory community, have frequently tried to understand the differences between these, these uh, systems. And by the way, actually, I must also commend the, the observatory for publishing probably the most comprehensive overview of what those systems look like, and I highly recommend it to anyone interested in jurisdiction, as I am, to read cover to cover, um, which I have done, probably twice. So. Um, uh, there are lots of different systems. It is not absolutely necessarily the case that every single EU member state would, for example, um, uh, impose some form of obligations or licensing obligations onto UK origin services in, in the event of Brexit. I don't think that's the case. I'd be interested in other views on that as well. Some would, some wouldn't. Some, for example, do not allow the distribution of non-EU licensed services or non-EU authorised services, but some countries don't. In addition, there is also the provision in the directive which kind of almost places a responsibility for jurisdiction onto certain countries in relation to services coming from third countries. Now, uh, what that means in reality is that even if uh, you know, some countries unilaterally decided that they, they were quite happy with UK origin services being regulated in the UK and coming into their uh, countries and being served to their audiences, it may be that there is an intermediary jurisdiction somewhere uh, with one of the satellite capacity countries, which the, which the, the, the oversight of that um, service in, in terms of the AVMS directive might fall to. These are all questions which are not necessarily easy to answer. And um, I think, you know, the current system is one that works really, really well, right? At the moment, we have a system by which uh, um, there is general trust in and support for Ofcom's uh, regulation of broadcasting services. I say that with a certain amount of pride and no complacency. We, we do a lot of, uh, of work to, to ensure that both the AVMS directive and, and other stricter rules are, are applied. Uh, and we do so uh, diligently and, and quite bureaucratically. And I say that with pride too. Now, um, that, that coming apart at the seams is causing lots and lots of problems for lots and lots of people, including ourselves. And, and indeed other regulators, and it will take time to, to iron out those problems. It will take time to discover exactly what problems it creates that we haven't even thought of yet, and we've been thinking about them for two years. So it's not ideal that the system is changing, because actually the system does work quite well. But um, it, I think, to, to, from our perspective, to conclude, uh, what I would say is that certainly Ofcom is committed to working with all of our fellow regulators, irrespective of uh, in which club they belong, <laughs> because we have our own clubs, um, and uh, we will do whatever we can to, to try to um, minimise um, any negative impacts on audiences, which we think about a lot, as well as, of course, the broadcasters themselves. Now, from the perspective of services moving, we have no, we are agnostic on this matter, uh, in the sense that, you know, we don't want to our licensees who, who we have you know relationships with and who we've worked with for a long time to to, to move but at the same time we completely understand their motivations and their um and their thought processes and, and you know where where possible we will we will offer help and support where that's appropriate and um and we can do what we can um we i can't really you know talk about exactly what what 
we know or think about where the services will leave or which ones are thinking about it and which ones are, um, uh, have done that. We have had certain, certain licenses um, withdrawn, um, so, give, so uh, they are no longer UK licenses. Some we know, and it's a matter of public record, have moved to other countries. I mean, we're talking about five here, you know, five or ten, something like not in the big numbers. Um, I guess we might see more. It all depends on, on how the cards fall over the next few weeks, and um, uh, we will do what we can to, to try to minimise disruption for everyone involved. But ultimately, there's there's, uh, there's a limit to how much we have control over the situation. Yeah, thank thank you thank you so much. Um, and I mean, you you put it very very well. Is the limit to preventing disruption now? <laughs> Maybe before we go, uh, give you another chance to, to ask a question or make a comment from, from the audience. Maybe just ask Alejandro, would you like to make a comment on what you would expect also being situated in a, in a big producing, uh, in a big market that also is targeted? And what would be your view on the balance within the ecosystem of uh, distribution of channels? <laughs> I mean, we can reasonably expect some disruption. We hope, of course, not that much. But um, would you like to comment on that? The media period group would be more than happy to, to, to get those uh, players who want to have the facilities uh, outside the UK. But uh, I have to say, <laughs> I have to say that uh, nowadays it's a uh, even for the case of Spain, there are three world channels that have their playouts in London. So, uh, and the change of that, it means uh, investment, money, people, I mean, there's a, a big amount of things behind it. So, there, there is where the, the, the disruption could be for also the UK based industry, yeah. but you wanted to contact just yet to tell me. Just wanted to quickly react to that because um, it's not really been mentioned here before. But one of the, as we understand it, one of the kind of potential uh, longer term uh, downsides for the UK in relation to companies potentially moving, um, and Ross may have more, more to say about this than, than I, than I but from the practical perspective. But but it is that kind of the, the, there is a huge industry that's grown up around the UK uh, licensing hubs and. And it includes post-production and play-out and all the other kind of technical support, never mind the talent base that's, that's also built up. And, and then I think particularly with the way that the jurisdiction criteria are written into the directive, which, which refer to you know, the workforce and where the workforce is located, it is possible, I can see, that certain functions of, of broadcasters could, could end up moving actually quite quickly. And those are the ones that, are, that you know, we, you know, they're not the, they're not our stakeholders, not the industries that we regulate. But, um, but in order to to move into a, a, a new jurisdiction, we might be looking at losing uh, losing quite a lot of those from the UK, and that would be, um, you know, well beyond any any kind of licensees moving. Mm. And it, it doesn't only affect the e, to the European Union; it only it also affects the rest of the world because 90% uh, of pay TV channels that are broadcasted in Africa, Africa or Middle East are being made in, in London. Not only the player, but also the the, the, the talent the people. Yes, absolutely, and, and and that and that shows that with all the willingness, and, and I, I think we heard a lot of. Uh, Similar voices, whether it's from industry um, or from from the BFI or from off going off to you know to, to get us through this transition period and beyond, actually looking for win-win solutions, there will be disruption. So, before um, giving the opportunity to the panelists to take a, a little bit of a long-term perspective in form of a closing statement, maybe I, I draw put the ball back into your court. Um, you have been very helpful in keeping us to the schedule, so uh, thanks for that, but you, you nonetheless are free to, uh, to ask a question or, or comment, and um, I just go in the order over here in the fourth row, and then Alison just a little bit beyond. I have a, I have a good question that is not exactly none of the three panels, but it's all of them. 
it would be it would be difficult for me to leave this place without asking you uh, about platforms. I know that it's not the the thing we have to discuss now, but how uh, can we imagine Brexit and the two, uh, 2020 and 2022, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, without thinking the reality of the market? There are platforms around. Part of the club is trying to work heavily to to um, regulate this fact and what will happen with UK. You will have the freedom to regulate them or not, or to join us on board on half and half. So it's impossible <laughs> to leave the place without asking it. Yeah, that, that's a very relevant question and also nicely uh, brings us also to the longer term uh, perspective about the evolution of the uh, regulatory environment and how the UK and the EU can evolve together in which form. So I think we we take that on, on board. But to uh, the next question before we give back to the panel. Okay, thank you. My name is Ganel Kone. I work for the EU European Broadcasting Union, representing uh, public service broadcasters. I have one comment and one question. My comment is addressed to, to us in all objectivity uh, when it comes to BBC's coverage uh, over the Brexit. I must, I must say that um, uh, in my personal opinion, uh, listening to the BBC before um, every other morning I was uh, particularly um, say uh, eager to, 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 to listen to hear how they do manage this and in my opinion they managed quite well and uh, so far, uh, also bearing in mind that they seem to have self-inflicted um, to themselves a, a, a rule to, to cover Brexit every single morning. So, um, <laughs> but that's that's uh, just a comment. And my question would be um, maybe to, to the sector, to the industry, uh, to Ross again, and uh, his uh, and Alejandro, uh, but also maybe the. Uh, uh, observatory. Um, there is one thing that I haven't heard today is the rest of the world. There is the EU, there is the UK, there is also this, the rest of the world and of course the UK is already uh, very much open to overseas. <coughs> um, would Brexit uh, be considered also as an opportunity for uh, UK operators to, to look into new avenues and actually invest more in those are new markets that, and, and turn away from the EU. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ginelle. A couple of more questions. We collect them and then give it back to the panel. Thank you, Cecilia May from SES Satellite Company. It's a question to, to Maria. Uh, uh, I completely agree with the fact that uh, very much depends uh, in, a little bit more in the future on the close collaboration amongst regulators. And the way it works now already shows the way. But practically uh, thinking, have you put your thoughts on where and how it's going to happen? Because I mean, if you're getting out the, of the EU, you won't be part of the club anymore. So you won't be in the compact committee, you won't be in ERGA. Uh, so should it be APRO? Should it be the Council of Europe uh, itself, a committee there, or anything else? Or are we just, you know, put our thumbs in the air and hope that? some kind of agreement will be found between the UK and, and the other member states. So, can, can, have you built up some scenario that would be interesting to hear? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Take uh, one more question here, and then there was a gentleman there. And then um, we give it back, and maybe we have time to come back again. Uh, thank you, Ed Hall from Expert Media Partners in London, and we work historically with licensees and assist on licensing issues, and obviously Brexit has become quite a significant part of that work. I think uh, I'd be quite interested to see how much, despite the uh, uh, apparent uh, cooperative air um, that, that we're hearing, um, you know, we're, we're currently looking for homes on behalf of clients for a significant number of licenses. And I chaired the panel in Ireland on, on Friday where the BAI said they've already had an application. You know, what, what we're really seeing, despite the, the warm handshakes and smiles, is a very competitive environment between licensing potential jurisdictions for channels. So there is you know, an active competition ongoing, a shopping uh, expedition, if you like, for licensees such as Ross to see you know, how the various criteria are going to be interpreted and effectively now are playing off one against the other. And I think that's been one of the reasons we've seen little activity so far. 
what of course I think when we talk about plans in, in bottom drawers, should we see this deal not get through the House of Commons in two or three weeks' time, which seems pretty likely on the basis of today's understanding of, of, of the mathematics of Parliament, at that point we're going to see something much more dramatic than I think a lot of this conversation sounds as though it is. So, you know, we're talking about channels being switched off in Ireland if they don't have an EU licence on the 30th of March. And one thing that comes very strongly through to us as we talk to um, licensees and to jurisdictions is that we're now talking about something which is a process that in many EU countries takes more than 90 days generally to assess and to issue a license or accept a service as being in that jurisdiction. So I think you know, we have a crunch now in December, January, where in the event that that deal fails and whether another deal will subsequently follow, we are going to see some very dramatic activity quite quickly in this sector. Okay, thank you. We'll take one more and then we'll give it back to the panel and then I will look carefully to Suzanne whether I can go back again or she will say no, you have to stop. So um, one more and then we give it back to them. Yeah, I think that's well. And I just want to make a very short comment. I think that it, I mean, I know Suzanne said not to go into scenarios. And I understand that, so let's not do that. But if after this meeting somebody wants to go into scenarios, <laughs> uh, there's just one element that I think is a fiction that is going on here that seems to think that after, so once the UK is not a member of the EU anymore, the rest of the world will respect anything that the UK and the EU agree upon. And that will not be the case. For example, at WTO, in a completely different area, in agriculture, in other stuff, you know. The UK and the EU went together to the WTO and they said, okay, this is what we have agreed that will follow. And of course the rest of the world, sitting on the WTO, say, wait a second, you know, the, the WTO, the, the EU will talk to us and cannot give to the UK something it has not given to us. What I mean by that is that the UK, once it is not a EU, it is not a EU member, full stop. And anything that is agreed to the UK might create a disadvantage with other members, with other states, sorry, including some of the other side of the of of, uh, of the Atlantic. But I'm also talking about Canada. I'm talking about Turkey. I'm talking of, of Northern Africa, which will be neighbors as much as the UK. So this idea that there's going to be a kind of isolated negotiation will not be the case. If it is within a, a treaty. A very complex treaty, the treaty will need to be compatible with WTO itself, but that might be the case. If it's a kind of, you know, one by one, well, let's do some kind of peace, peace milling here and there, I think that is part of the picture that needs to be taken there. It, the EU will not be able, even if it wants to, will not be able to give to the UK things it doesn't give to everybody else, or at least to other neighbors, or at least to other third countries in the same position. Thanks. Okay, thank you all and thank you all for your contributions, questions, comments. I would like to give it back to, uh, to the panelists, um, picking up on some points on the competitiveness of the environment, the disruption we already mentioned, uh, the question of what actually can be the tools of cooperation that was uh, mentioned uh, before concretely, um, um, but also the complexity of of course, we are not living in an isolated world of the UK and the EU, but in a, in a globalized uh, digital economy. Um, so if, um, if I may, Maria, could I ask you to be the first respondent? Because I think a lot of the questions were directly also going into um, how often we would like to approach that. Uh, thank you all for all your questions. Um, um, there was a question about platforms, which I think I might leave perhaps for other members of the panel, just because I think it might be, I don't want to take up too much time and I will um, uh, con concentrate on cooperation and licensing. Um, I will just quickly say though that in terms of the UK's, and I'm not here to talk for the government um, at all, but uh, the publicly stated um, policies in the UK are to reflect on um, uh, internet regulation and that there is intended to be a white paper published early next year uh, which will set out the UK's policy in this area. So I think that the answer for, for in terms of whether or not the UK is intending to 
or what it's intending to do in relation to platforms and how that um, uh, corresponds to the proposals in the directive, irrespective of any transposition uh, questions, will be answered by that white paper. So that's that's just a, uh, from the UK's perspective. Um, but I think it's important that you raised it. Um, so the question from uh, you was about um, uh, collaboration and uh, the plans we have. So contact committees for member states, so that's not um, for, for, for me to comment on. Um, uh, Erga, there are different ways to read the withdrawal agreement and it is not absolutely clear to me exactly what the situation is, but my understanding at the moment on the basis of the current rules of procedure of Erga and the status that the UK is likely to have, even in the transition period, is that it is unlikely that we will be able to continue to participate and um, there may be some potential options for the Commission to invite us as, as an external expert or something like that. But in any event, we're, not, we're certainly not expecting to, to for, you know, the current um, uh, network arrangements to apply. Um, that said, um, we have, so we have a, a, a place on the board of EPRA uh, and, are, and have always have been extremely active and committed to EPRA. Um, the meeting on cooperation that I mentioned took place at, at the EPRA autumn meeting and it, again, and I stress this one more time, um, the meeting very much and very strongly concluded that informal cooperation uh, was at the very heart of, of the work that we do amongst regulators and so irrespective of any written down legal obligations, uh, regulators will continue to work together as I say, to um, to ensure that the protections and the and the responsibilities that we all have continue to be applied appropriately. Um, you know, we talk to our fellow regulators and bilaterally within other groups all the time. Uh, you know, it, this is this is just not it's not one of those things that, that that really hangs on any particular kind of legal obligation. And so, I I don't want to be complacent, and I don't want to to make less of of the point, but I think that um, certainly Ofcom's commitment to that kind of international uh, engagement and and participation um, is is I think beyond question, and, and so we fully intend to uh, be very very active in, in on all of the forum which we can participate, and and that kind of goes you know outside of the audiovisual sphere as well. It's really important to note that you know we um, have begun to contribute to the debates about internet regulation within the UK. We are a you know we are a leading expert group. We produce almost unparalleled research into into consumer attitudes, into viewer attitudes, into um, media use and, and, and so on and, and we are increasingly um, thinking about how we can be active in the sphere of media literacy as well. So so you know we see ourselves as as a natural uh, interlocutor and partner for, for the regulatory community and beyond that and I don't believe that the that, that Brexit will if anything you know but we will redouble our efforts in that in that area um, in, in relation to this uh, development. Um, in terms of the uh, competition for licenses, I mean, I have to say it's not it's not something I I really uh, heard to be the case. Um, I guess it's not unusual to imagine that you know if you throw a load of things up into the air, there may be a little bit of a scrabble as they come back down. But um, but I you know to, just to be clear, that's not competition with us. Um, and so wherever the cards fall. Uh, and whoever you know is interested in, in, in potentially being the home. I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that you say that because if there is competition, I would imagine it would be at the kind of government level rather than at the regulatory level. Generally speaking, you know, while the, the, while there's fees associated with licenses, and I suppose there's a certain kind of status and cachet with being with being responsible for a lot of services with the responsibilities that that brings. Um, I think that generally speaking, you know, independent regulators uh, don't have a specific interest in, in getting new licenses and so, but, you know, I can only give you my perspective on that but I, I, I've not really encountered that to be the case. Um, I think that's, I think that's everything on the left, if you know if I've missed anything. Okay, thank you so, so much Maria. Um, Taking the other issue, that, I mean, two related issues, WTO, but also looking at the prospects of the 
developing um, business um, in other areas than the EU country. Maybe a first remark from Suzanne and then maybe some reaction from, from our some colleagues from the business side. I just uh, want to also add one, one thing to what Maria said uh, concerning the cooperation. I think we should not forget that also the other regulators will continue to have a need to cooperate with the UK. It's not one way. And indeed, a project <coughs> seems to be very important. I mean, we're happy at the observatory to host the upper secretariat so we can see how much exchange is really going on, and don't forget, EPRA dates much longer than ERGA or actually many other networks that are now very much in the news, but EPRA has been steadily working and cooperating, and uh, <laughs> there are quite some signs that the other regulators will uh, continue to have the same need, and if it's just for transition period or forever, it's very hard to predict. Um, I was just a really grateful that you respected so far, um, my plea to, talk, to look more on pragmatic things. Uh, the point that you made on WTO is, of course, is, is a very strong one. It was one that also interested us. What I say now is really, I admit hearsay, but I did um, ask this question to somebody from the DCMS in the UK. And um, I got the answer that actually the UK has already uh, made a deal more or less with the WTO. WTO to get out of the WTO, no, of the EU, and stay exactly with the same rights that they had. Now, I cannot see uh, the details, but I think it's just the message to say it's not that they're sleeping, sleeping over that. They're quite aware that there are other fronts that have opened up and that need to be handled. And yes, there are all a lot of very difficult issues that follow from that, but this is actually very good for another very long, intense conference. Yeah, or discussion afterwards. But giving uh, quickly the floor back to the other panelists who may want to react to some of the things that have been said in the comments or questions, Ross. Um, just to Benel's point about uh, whether this is encouraging companies to look beyond uh, the European markets. When speaking for Discovery, we're obviously a global company anyway. Uh, we're actually active in over 200 countries and territories, which is more than the United Nations as member states. So there, there really isn't, uh, in, in, and the same would be you know, the case for your members for BBC Worldwide or for ITV Studios. Um, so there isn't uh, a feeling within most of the UK industry that I'm aware of that there are these huge um, untapped uh, horizons out there for us to go and, uh, go and look for. Maybe for um, you know, for people just coming into the industry, that might be the case. Uh, PAX, the independent producers, have also been very, very aggressive and successful in terms of their trade missions. I mean, they've put a lot of effort uh, into selling programs to China, for example. Um, but uh, I think in, in general for the industry, I think t television and media is now a, a global business anyway, uh, when you're competing with the big platforms, the escorts, etc. Um, and I'm not sure Brexit has already advanced that process either way. Yeah, thank you, Ross. Alejandro, I think you would agree. Yeah, that I agree with first that uh, audiovisual business has become a, a, world, a world global business. But it wasn't like that like uh, 25 years ago where you had the, the local programming, you had the, the, the US content, and sometimes you could see uh, the yellow car plate on, on the screen that was a product that was coming from the UK. But now um, it is true that we are focusing a lot in the UK, but uh, uh, there are other countries that are producing in a, in a very improved way. But here we have to talk about TV stations. Those are the uh, most uh, conservative players in the game. So they are the ones who have to start to demand content, contents for, from, from different countries around the world. This is something that is starting to happen, but uh, we have to go to this. I think the harder the Brexit is, the faster that this process will go ahead, and the global uh, content in, in, in channels will have more, more space. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, we, we are coming very uh, shortly to the close. In a few moments, I will ask uh, Suzanne to conclude. But before doing this, I wanted to come back to Harriet and, and ask her, from her perspective, as being in an organization that really wants to cherish the industry, 
looking at the longer term perspective, um, can you bring us back to optimism after we have been uh, a little bit through the disruptive elements in the last couple of 15 minutes? Hopefully. So I think we've been through a number of things which explain hopefully clearly where we are now and what we know now and obviously there is a big question mark over what happens in the next couple of weeks. But I think something that we have been doing at the BFI for the last year is working on incredibly hard is this idea of what do we need to sustain continued cultural and creative cooperation post-Brexit. And it's something that we've done a lot of work on with stakeholders ranging from the BBC to ITV through to all of the cultural sector, video games, VFX. So a very strong group of representatives from across all the, all the UK screen industries. And it is very, very much focused on people. But also I think there are some things which we don't necessarily do as much as we could do at the moment, which are very much around pressing issues around not just freedom of movement to people, but actually the skills that those people need. I mean, all of us know that one of the biggest challenges that we have is actually having a highly skilled workforce. It's not just mobile, but highly skilled. It's certainly a challenge we have in the UK. There are lots and lots of programmes that we're all undertaking, and I'm quite sure that there could be more exchange of those programmes. Very much fits the spirit of the dialogue, the cultural and educational dialogue. Something as well in the UK that we have done a tremendous amount of work on is diversity. Um, and again, I think there is a moment perhaps for that dialogue, the cultural education dialogue, to include a very, very strong element of looking at diversity across all the areas of diversity. Um, and again, something we've been very, very active on at the BFI in the UK, and we'd be very happy to share our learnings on that through some sort of more formal accord. Those funding programmes going forward, you know, Creative Europe, we talked about the funding that it underpins in terms of distribution, but actually it is those networks that it's enabled across Europe, and I think anything that helps underpin those ongoing networks is fantastic. They help with innovation, they help with education, they help with R&D, and they help with us develop audiences who are receptive to fresh, young, bright thinking in terms of the sort of content uh, that we're creating at the moment. Um, so I do actually think there are lots of opportunities. I think they're around the areas of skills, talent, diversity, and also innovation. Thank you so much, and um, I, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you all, uh, Alejandro, Maria, Harriet, Ross, Gilles, and Suzanne for participating in the panel. I hope I behaved uh, politically sound uh, in uh, facilitating the conversation, and I hand over to uh, Suzanne. Thank you very much, Johannes. I think we can confirm that you did not only behave very well, but that you were actually excellent, so all our sincere thanks. <laughs> wasn't easy. Um, I thank all to you. thank you all for coming, for having stayed, for having at the end taken the opportunity to also discuss. Honestly, we had hoped to have a little bit more feedback, but maybe uh, you are all also quite baffled about you know how things develop, how they work. Um, we will at our end bring this discussion a little bit uh, to Strasbourg and to the Council of Europe, where right now. The Steering Committee on um, Media and Mass Communications is uh, having its long session and we were, as always, invited to speak a little bit about the observatory, but this time we'll also speak a little bit about those things that we have learned and exchanged today in this conference. So your thoughts will travel with us and I hope we can welcome you again next year on a topic still to be defined, maybe still in this beautiful place, it will be very nice. So my thanks again to Bavaria and I wish you all a great afternoon. Continue talking, but please, outside. <laughs> <laughs>